Good morning, church. Good morning. Are you ready to jump? I love that one. Yeah. Everybody's going, yeah, not so much. Not so much. Yeah. I did like three hours of yard work yesterday. I'm happy to be standing today. But this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. What a gorgeous day. Beautiful day yesterday in and out of the rain. Um, but, you know, it's refreshing. It kind of gives us that uplifting that we need to have. And it's just uh, wonderful to see what God puts into our lives and gives us that little respite from all the gray and the dreariness and all the stuff of the world. And we get to have sunshine out here, beautiful blue skies, a little light breeze, just, just a beautiful day. So it's a great day to be alive in God. Amen. 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 So this Wednesday, and actually kicking off this morning with our service today, we are going to be uh, starting our seven-part study, which is Pre-Decide, Better Choices, Better Life. And we're going to dig deeper into the message that Pastor Terry's given us this morning uh, on Wednesday. And here's our topics as we come up ahead in the dates for them. Take Back Your Life, Keys to Overcoming. The power of consistency, getting closer to God when you stop holding back, and one word that will change your life. And then the last one, when you want to give up, we need to press on. So this, uh, we've got that coming up. We're, we're starting that today. So over the next seven weeks, we'll have uh, a way to kind of jumpstart your life and get back on track with God. So it's, it's awesome. I'm, I'm excited about it. October 8th, if you can believe it, it's only 12 days from now. <laughs> we're going to have orange track racing back in here. So we're going to convert this place into a racetrack and have good times. Wade, I'm sure, will eat at least one or two or six hot dogs, uh, <laughs> along with his six bags of chips and his six <laughs> Diet Cokes. Got to have the Diet Coke. Uh, coming up in November, we're going to have our Christmas movie, and, and so we're reviewing several different titles coming along the line right now. Um, I reviewed a whole bunch, I don't want to say a whole bunch, probably, what, maybe 10 last night? A lot. And uh, so I went through and, and because uh, I had to sit down, I couldn't move. <laughs> Too much yard work. Um, so we're kind of going through some of the titles, and uh, we're going to come up with a choice here pretty quick. One of my one of my uh, criteria for the movie was it can't be a tearjerker type movie. It's going to have some emotion to it because it kind of makes you, you know, want to be into the movie a little bit. But it's not going to be a tearjerker. So uh, Thanksgiving outreach, we're we're looking to see what we want to do this year for our outreach, and uh, we're wanting suggestions so <clears throat> we can kind of come together. It's not that far off, believe it or not. This year is just absolutely flying by. It's hard to believe we're at the end of September already, isn't it? Wow. So we got the Christmas movie or Thanksgiving outreach, and we talked about this Wednesday night. It's that time of year we have to start planning for our Christmas caroling. So we want to get some suggestions on where we can go, uh, what care centers and things that we'd like to eh, bless with our voices. We're kind of planning to practice a little bit this year on Wednesday night, so we want to make a joyful noise uh, as we're in there singing for the people. Uh, at that study coming up as well, so that uh, that starts in about uh, 10 weeks. Uh, can you believe that? Yeah, this year is just flying by. This year we're doing what's uh, a plan called the Advent Conspiracy. And uh, this is one that was developed by a group of pastors, and it's to really take a step back, take a look at Christmas, and say, what are really the priorities of the season? What should we be spending our time, our efforts, our money, and those things on? And it's kind of reprioritizing Christmas, and it's called the Advent Conspiracy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I think everybody will be kind of touched with that one there too. It's it's got some hard-hitting uh, points that are made in that um, and so hopefully it'll kind of refocus what Christmas is all about for us. So as we come into our time of worship this morning, let's bow our heads in prayer, shall we? 
Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for another day in your presence, another day of life, Lord, with you. We thank you, Lord, that you are ever present in our lives each and every day. We know, Lord, that you will respond to us and you will answer our prayers if we come earnestly before you with those prayers. Lord, we, we thank you and we praise you for not abandoning us even though we are sinners. We're in need of your grace and mercy. So, Lord, we call upon that today. We, we repent of our sins. We want to be reconciled with you. And, Lord, we pray that by the power and the love and the blood of Jesus that you will forgive us of our sins, that we'll be washed clean, and that we will be reconciled with you. Lord, we just lift up Pastor Terry as he brings the message that you put on his heart today. Lord, we just ask that you would open our ears to hear that message our eyes to understand and receive the wonders and glory of the message that is brought forth today, and our hearts to be open to receive that message in and live it out each and every day. Lord, we thank you that you are a fantastic God that watches us each and every day, every step we take. You are there, and all we need to do if we need your help is to call upon your Lord, we thank you in all these things. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So our call to worship this morning comes from Proverbs 16.3. And this one is the New International Version. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. So it seems like a very short, very concise message in here. But when we look at the passage, it calls us to action immediately. We need to commit our plans to God when we want our plans to succeed. So commit to the Lord whatever you do. Commit to that, that plan to the Lord, and then he will establish your plans. Meaning he will bless those plans. But we got to take them to the Lord first. A lot of times, what do we do? We get out there, we chug down the road on our own plan, doing our own direction and then God comes up or something comes up smacks us alongside the head knocks us off track and then then after we stumble and fall then we go to God and say hey help me out of this mess that I've created and we use God as a crutch and so what we want to do is we want to kind of and this is what our message series is going to be we want to pre-decide to go to God first and commit our plans to him and then we know it's going to succeed. So this tells us following God's revealed purpose is the only way then that we should conduct our life. See, we're still free to choose as we will. We still have that free will. But God takes every event and works it into his will for us. If, if we go first to God and invite him in. See, we have to invite him to be part of that plan in order for him to work that plan. Otherwise, it's just our plan, you know, our own plan. So, no suggestion is made that he causes all events to happen. He's active in each event to produce his own purposes. Sometimes he kind of lets us go down that path to where we've stumbled and fallen so far that we're literally crawling on our bellies. Then he goes, okay, okay, now. You're not going to depend on yourselves. You're going to commit your life to me. And guess what? He pulls us up out of the mire in the mud, mm -hmm. gets us up off our bellies, and gets us back onto the track mm -hmm. for the will that he has in our lives. Mm -hmm. Thus, God's gift of individual freedom is balanced by his faithfulness to his own purposes. He will work in every situation to save and redeem in accordance with his will. So the author that was asking, would it not be much better if a human were submissive to God and his purposes rather than their own from the very beginning? Imagine how much better life would be if we committed our, our life to God first and then said, hey, God, guide and direct me on the path that I should be on. Here's where I want to go. Here's what I want to do. Hmm. So the New Living Translation says, Commit your actions to the Lord, and your plans will succeed. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, good morning. Good morning. 
pre-decide was just such a weird word to see. <laughs> when Mark and I were looking at this and, and talking about this and praying about this series, it was like this just fits perfectly in this as we as we keep moving along and, and what we need to be doing. And to think about it, the decisions that we make today will determine the life that we have tomorrow. Even the smallest of decisions. I, I for whatever reason, I'm thinking, well, I walked over there and I see these little <laughs> yummy looking, tiny little pumpkins. I guess one of them's got a coffee or espresso. It's got a ganache. ganache. We've got an international today. So. Yeah, I'm looking at them going, and, and I pre I pre decided that I was probably going to try to stay away from the treats this morning. And I went over and I looked at him and I said, Lord, help me. <laughs> he said, you got to get up in front of everybody here pretty soon. You don't want to be coughing because you swallowed it too quickly. So, decision made. After. Yeah, afterwards, <laughs> I, don't, I can't guarantee anything afterwards, but you know. But when you think about decisions, is your life moving in the direction of your decisions? I think of, I think of golf, you know. Man, why did the ball go that way? Well, it's because that's where you hit it direction that your life is going is what based on your decision so here's a question do you like the direction that your life is going or taking you and how can we make sure that we like the direction our lives are going well it starts by building right habits and disciplines and who has tried to make a change to their habits and disciplines and not easy it requires a lot of discipline to change those habits and disciplines, and it takes intentionality to get there. Many years ago when I started reading uh, Bible plans to, to read through the Bible, and, and I decided I was going to pick a plan that took me through the Bible in a year. And I started on a plan, and by golly, I love that plan. It's a life journal reading plan. I love it. I read it for... 10 years straight and I was so stuck in that plan that to think about changing to a different one was a little, maybe a little anxious but I have changed I did this year change to a different one it's from uh, Nikki Gumbel who is he and his wife Lee Alpha if you've heard of that and it's been fulfilling and so what other changes can I make in my spiritual life, Lord, is the question that I've been asking. It took some intentionality. I got there. Becoming the person you want to be starts long before the moments you make that decision. Now think about this. It happens when you click buy. Now, how many of you get on your phones and get on the computer and click buy, whether it's Amazon or JC Pennies or Kohl's or wherever you're buying from, you get on the click buy. Or before you take, well, do I really need that? Do I really need to take another? Do I really need to go up? You know, your pizza ranch. Do you really need to go up after another piece of pizza? Well, it's dessert pizza. Maybe one more. <laughs> or before it happens, before you lash out at the people you love. With God's help, we will determine our course of action before that moment of decision. And we'll, we'll get more into what that looks like here in just a little bit. But then the direction or the decisions you make today will help you live the life you really want to tomorrow. And you may be living a really good life right now, but God might have something even better and more for you. So think about that. Let's look at Isaiah. We're going to look at Isaiah 43, uh, verses 18 and the first part of 19. And this is what the prophet says. He said, but forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I'm going to do. For I am about to do something new. God is saying, you saw all the wonderful things I've already done, but boy, i got something even better for you. Just wait. Buckle up. Now, this question can also be applied to yourself and the people you know. What is the difference, though, between those who are fulfilled and those who are not? 
that kind of fits right into our whole uh, message today, which it's predecessed, but it's, it's take back your life. So when I say fulfilled, I don't mean just mediocre and, and you're getting, you know, just, well, think about a, a work evaluation. It's meets. You know, if it was worse, then, you know, you wouldn't be so fulfilled. You're just meets fulfilled. I'm talking about exceeds fulfilled here. It's about strong relationships with those around you and around the people around you, your family, your friends, your coworkers. It's about uh, being financially strong and generous. Now, does that mean that you're going to have millions of dollars? No, I'm talking about not having to worry about paycheck to paycheck kind of life. And it's a positive, loving life kind of a fulfillment. Then there's those who aren't fulfilled. They struggle with relationships might be trying to hold their family together. It might be working through a breakup or a divorce. It might be that barely getting by, living paycheck to paycheck. Been there, done that. I didn't buy the t-shirt the because I couldn't afford it. Life is hard, and when it's hard, what happens? We feel empty. And we know that there's got to be something more, but how do we find out what it is? And so many people are out in this world today that don't know Jesus, that don't have a relationship, that they're wondering, there's that hole in their heart, and they're struggling. They don't know what it is that can bring that fulfillment. So what's, what's the difference? What, what's the difference between being fulfilled and not fulfilled? Well, let's knock off some things that don't have anything to be, do with being fulfilled. And some of you might, I, I can almost imagine seeing some squinty eyes going, what? But here's some things that don't have anything to do with whether you're fulfilled or not. Intelligence. Talent. Appearance. Finances. Let's face it. You can be smart, talented, rich, and good looking and still be miserable. Think of some of these uh, celebrities over, you know, just in recent years, and you can go back further, but um, they had it all. Marilyn Monroe, she was smart, even though she kind of played off of it as a dizzy blonde. She had talent, she had appearance, and she certainly had finances. But there was something missing, and she ultimately took her own life. Judy Garland, same thing. Now, Kurt Cobain, I don't, I don't know if he had quite the appearance, but he had talent, he had intelligence, and he had finances, yet he took his own life. So there's a lot of that out there. There's day, just everyday people. They have that hole in their heart, and they end things because they aren't fulfilled. Now, I've met very intelligent, very talented people who can't hold a job. They're not fulfilled. They're constantly looking for the next best thing. So they're just wandering through life. See, people don't understand why. Because they had it all. Why am I not fulfilled? I have everything I want. But you can be fulfilled without those things. How many people have seen those people that live on the edge of poverty, but they are the most fulfilled, they're the happiest, they have the most loving family. They don't have to have those other things. But they have Jesus. That's the difference. And, and it really gets it, boils it down to the decisions we make. You see, every decision we make ripples through our lives. My dad and I were talking um, here a couple weeks ago, and my dad worked for a, an implement company down in the little tiny town of Prairie City, less than a thousand people. But there was this pretty good sized company called Dowdens. They made a lot of things. They made wagons. They were most famous for their potato pickers. They had a device that, and they were all over the, the country, these potato pickers. But in 1970, Hades bought them out. And my dad could have stayed where he was. He could have farmed a family farm, and I would have grown up there. But 
mom and dad made the decision to go to Clarion, two hours away. That one decision had a ripple effect across the rest of our lives, both for them and for my brother and I. So then you start thinking about, as I'm doing this, all these decisions I've made in my life start rippling through my mind going, what if I had taken that job out in Washington State 23 years ago? <laughs> or actually, 25 years ago. Because it was just before Diane and I met 24 years ago. I would have never met Diane. I wouldn't know any of you. The ripple effects. The decisions that we make are in extremely and indescribably important quality of our decisions determines the quality of our lives. They determine whether or not we are fulfilled. Now there's a problem here because I don't know about y'all, but we're lousy at making decisions. Where do you want to eat? That's going to be the question right after church. What do you want for lunch? And the decision will not be an easy one. Be, I don't know, what do you want? You know, those little Diane messed around one time she was going to take those old toys that you know, pulled aside and the thing spun around and then stop them in the place on sound she was going to put restaurants all the way around it and we just, it's like playing roulette pull the arm see where we're going now if you think about all your life you could probably think of at least one either dumb or bad decision that you have regretted Good news. Mm -hmm. The series that we're about to, that we're undertaking right now is going to help us look at the power of the decisions that we make. One of the most powerful decisions that we can make, of course, is accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So today, we're going to start by answering the question, why do we struggle to make good decisions? Why do we struggle make good decisions. There's a reason for it. And did, did you ever think it might have been easier to make a decision when you were a kid than when you're an adult? Well, to begin with, we're overwhelmed with choices. Anybody remember when burger joints just sold burgers and fries and maybe some soda and a, maybe a shake? No, they, when I worked for Hardee's, we sold burgers, we sold chicken sandwiches and we sold fries and you know that then all of a sudden we bought Roy Rogers and now we're selling fried chicken and uh, Red Robin over here just bought Donato's pizza so now they're serving pizza at Red Robin I'm not getting any promotional money for mentioning either of those it's just <laughs> their example that adds to our decisions now, admittedly, um, COVID has kind of helped with our decision-making process, at least when we're at the restaurant once we finally make it, because what happened, the menu shrunk, mm -hmm. which I'm okay with that. But here it is. As adults, we make an estimated 35,000 decisions or choices every single day. It might be as simple as what side of your mouth are you starting to brush your teeth on today? That, right? Those, I'm serious. Top or bottom, front, back. Those are decisions. Those are choices that we're making. In contrast, a young child, all of about 3,000. Now I talked about what are we going to have for lunch or what are we going to have for dinner? Well, then once we do that, we have to figure out, is this good for us or not? Yes, Denny, biscuits and gravy is good for us. <laughs> Especially when eaten at church because calories, no, they do count, but we like to think they don't. And, and do we end up eating more than what we should? Diane and I used to um, think it odd that her dad and stepmom would order a meal at a restaurant and they would split it. We just thought that was just the strangest thing in the world. Guess what? That's what we do. Because we don't, do we need to eat more? No, we, but 
then there's the decision of what to wear. How many of you go to the closet and you've got two dozen sh you know, shirts to choose from? Which one am I going to wear today? Well, no. How often do we buy things we can't afford because of a decision we made? Or we say things we can't or that we regret. Open mouth, insert foot type of thing. And do we do things that we shouldn't do? The list goes on and on and on. And it's nonstop from the moment we wake up to the moment that we go to sleep. And sometimes our brains are still firing and we can't get to sleep. And if you're Pastor Mark, you wake up in the middle of the night because your mind is still going <laughs> and you're trying to get back to sleep. But get, aren't, don't you get worn out from all those decisions? It is like mentally exhausting sometimes. And when we start to get exhausted when we're making decisions, is it any wonder that every once in a while we make a bad decision? It's due to what cognitive scientists call decision fatigue. The quality of our decisions decrease with the more decisions that we make. And the more fatigue, we are more afraid of making wrong decisions, which leads to more decisions because you know, now you're worried about making the wrong choice. This is true of us as Christians. Now think about this. We don't want to miss out on what God's will is, so we start running through our minds. And what are we forgetting to do as we're running all those things through our minds? Are, are we really doing what God wants us to do? Is this what God wants? And in doing that, we tend to overanalyze and that causes more and more and more decisions. And more and more decisions leads us down that path to wrong decisions. Now, just for a little bit of clarity, indecision, not making a decision, that's a decision as well because you chose not to decide. <laughs> and at some point in the process of making decisions, we let our emotions overrule logic. Now things get real interesting when this happens. Think about a time when that happened to you. Now, I know a young lady, fresh out of college, she had a car from high school, she was getting a new job, and she decided, by golly, she needed a new car. Even though the old car ran just fine, she needed a new car. Now, logically speaking, that car would have lasted a little, it was paid off, the repairs on it were going to be less than having a monthly payment for five years or whatever, because now they go out to what, seven, eight years, it's kind of gotten a little ridiculous. But she got it in her head that she needed a new car. And so she went out, she found one, and what she do? she bought it right away. Think about that. And now think about this. Have you ever had someone do something that affected you one way or another and you told yourself, do not say anything, just let it go? Now I gotta wonder, did the parents of this young lady say something to her <laughs> instead of letting it go? Well, how about this? Something happens at home, your spouse does something and subconsciously you say, don't do anything. Don't say anything, just let it go. But your subconscious takes over and all of a sudden you become a little passive aggressive. <laughs> and then you might go, no, I didn't want to do that. Don't say anything, just shut up and move on. Yet, all of a sudden, your lips start moving and you say something. I do this. This is where this example comes. This is fresh, this is me, I do this. And it's like, I regret it. It's like taking toothpaste and squirting it all out and then trying to put it back into the tube. You can't do it. Once it's out, it's done. Now, I was going to put a cartoon picture up on, on the screen and I, and I forgot. But do you remember like Tom and Jerry cartoons where there was the little, Tom had the little Jerry on one shoulder and on the other one was an angel and was the, the devil? It's, that's kind of where you're at. That's kind of what you're... I think of when I think of when that happens emotions get in the way 
they get in the way of the decision making process and what do we do we end up hurting someone else or even ourselves so we have to remember do not make permanent decisions based on temporary emotions because these emotions and these decisions we make in the heat of the moment will end up hurting someone. And this goes back to the quality of our decisions, determining the quality of our lives. If you're constantly letting your emotions make your decisions, where is that going to lead? It's going to lead you into an unhappy relationship. And where does those end up going when they spiral out of control? So think about it this way. We make our decisions, and our decisions make us. Now, there are decisions that we make in the moment, and there are others that we will decide will happen later. So deciding before is one of the best ways to live a forward-looking, people-loving, God-glorifying life. This is the power of pre-deciding. Better choices means a better life. And as Christians, we need to be asking God to help us make decisions ahead of time. Just go back and look at the Old Testament, read it through. You can get, you don't have to go many, you know, many chapters of any of the books to see the Israelites forgetting to seek God and what happens. Not anything good. But when they turn around and they seek Him, that changes. God's giving us examples in the scriptures of what this looks like. So we need to seek his guidance in our future plans so that we can bring honor to God in the decisions that we make. Now Mark read Proverbs 16.3 from the NIV. I'm going to read it from the Amplified Version. It says, commit your works to the Lord, but in parentheses it says, submit and trust them to him. And your plans will succeed if you respond to his will and guidance. There's that extra piece that we have to remember. That there's, uh, Mark was alluding to it during the call to worship this morning. There's more to it. This very short verse is very big. It is full of meaning. God must affirm our plans, so asking for his guidance simply makes sense. Yet all too often we fail to commit whatever it is we are doing to the Lord. And here's what that looks like. Sometimes our commitment is only superficial. Sometimes it's just for show. Now, I'm just going to say this so that everybody else thinks, you know, and it's just for show. Sometimes we say it is for God when in reality it's for whom? It's ourselves. We're selfish. Sometimes we only hand over partial or even temporary control to God. And then if things aren't going the way we want, what do we do? Oh, well, God's not doing it right, so I better take this back and do it myself. And how well does that go? Sometimes we do fully commit to God, but it stops right there because we don't put any effort into it. There is a delicate balance here. One in which we put our trust in God as if it all depends on him the other is if putting forth the effort as if everything depends on us it's a two-way street we have to go to God first but once we go to God then we have to then take action so back to what the way Mark read it is says commit to the Lord whatever you do and he will establish your plans this is whatever you do in relationships, in your marriage, in your being a parent, in your finances, in your work, everything. All of it. Jesus tells us to put God first in our life. Matthew 6, 33 from the message puts it this way. It says, steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions, and don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Fill your thoughts with God's desires. See his character as the pattern for your life. In the last series, last couple series, what did we talk about? We were created in God's image. 
So if we're created in his image, then God's character should be that pattern. And if we're not putting God first, then the other things will become our priority. And we will not be serving and obeying God like we should. When we are putting him first, seeking him, as we look at the decisions ahead of us, God will help us with our plans. He will help us to pre-decide what we will do later in the decision-making process, but that happens now. For example, many times throughout your life, you will need to make a big decision regarding purchases. I think back to the young lady buying the car. Diane's watched me get up and walk out of a dealership. It's like, yeah, we're done. I walk out, get home, and probably don't go back. And I'm awful when it comes to buying a, a fairly expensive uh, purchase. Back in 2014, Carissa needed a new laptop for school. She said, I want the laptop you would buy. And so starts all my research. I asked her what things that she needed out of it and what she wanted out of it. And I finally settled on a specific laptop. Nice 17.2 inch touch screen, big keyboard, DVD drive, the whole works. And that computer just died. Mm -hmm. That was eight years ago. Wow. Uh, I think that's a pretty good decision. Mm -hmm. So six months later, when my old laptop died and I bought the exact same one, she was like, copycat. I was like, you, told, <laughs> you wanted the same one I would buy. Mm -hmm. We had a little fun with that one. But don't make an impulse buy. That's why they put those the candy and the magazines right up front at the grocery store, so you'll just grab it and take it. And I like to go home and think about it. How often do you go home if you think about it? Say, I'm going to pre-decide now that for big purchases, I'm going to sit on that decision for three days, or whatever that time frame is, before I make that decision. That's what this pre-deciding is all about. You avoid the impulse buy. You avoid potentially buying something that isn't, wasn't right in the first place. And then you ultimately get what you need. Maybe not what you wanted, but you get what you need. Now, we all worry. And if you say you don't, I'm calling your bluff, because you do. Mm -hmm. We all worry. And when we worry, it's easy to start, what, losing faith in God. So we pre-decide that instead of going to people, going to the bottle, drinking, or posting your dirty laundry on social media, that before you do anything else, you're going to go to God. You pre-decide before you even get to that decision-making time. In other words, you humble yourself and take it to God instead. Peter talks about this in 1 Peter 5, 6 and 9. He says, So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Scripture is full of of examples of this. See, Abraham knew that God was always trustworthy, so what did he do? He pre-decided that whatever God asked him to do, he would do. So when God asked him to sacrifice Isaac, what did he do? He took Isaac, they went up, and they went off and up the mountain, right? Crazy. But he went because he'd already pre-decided that whatever God asked him to do. And it's no different with Ruth. First chapter of Ruth, we hear her commitment to Naomi. She pre-decided that she would go wherever Naomi went and live there and be a part of Naomi's people. And she also decided this, that Naomi's God would be her God and 
What do we know about Ruth? She, what line is she in? She's in the line that leads us to Jesus. Then there's Daniel. He and his friends, they predecided that when they went into exile, that they would not dishonor God, that they would not bow down, they would not drink, and they would not eat the food. Well, we'll talk about Daniel later in this series, so we'll just leave it at that. What do you value? What are the things that are most important to you? When others talk about you and describe you, what do you want them to say? How do you want to be known? What do you want your reputation to be? As we go through the next seven weeks, Pastor Mark and I want you to know and honestly and truly think about the following. And these are going to, these are the things that we've got coming up. We want you to seek God by praying about it. We want you to commit everything to God. And as you do this, you will, with God's help, start to pre-decide the decisions you will make in the future concerning every aspect of your life. What will happen when you do this? It will become clear to you what things you value. And when you, your values are clearer, then your decisions will be as well. Then over and over and over again, it will save you from situations, bad decisions, and things that might otherwise have caused you to regret. Because none of us likes regret. That's just something that's rent-free in your head. <laughs> You've heard Pastor Mark say this many, many times. And I've carried it or echoed it too. Life ends, eternity where? Decisions determine the direction which determines eternity. So when that question, that this question, just like that, our call to worship this morning, four words with a question mark, but huge implications. Making wise, God honoring decisions will help you take back your life. So don't wait until it's too late to make a change in the direction of your life course that's the last opportunity to make that decision is your last breath we never know when that is so pre-decide to do it sooner rather than later the problem is there are traits that each of us have that to some degree or another get in the way let's talk about those first one is we are inconsistent I know I am I don't want to be, but I am. I'll start off doing something, I'll start off doing it right, but then I get tired, either physically, emotionally, or spiritually, and I end up doing the wrong thing. What happens when you're not consistent? Well, then we are unprepared. Now, you've heard us talk about starting your day with God, but I'm guilty of this, too. That can be inconsistent. Something got in the way. It's like letting our guard down, and when we do that, what happens? Satan attacks. If we're not starting our day with God, then we are unprepared for those spiritual attacks. Instead of being proactive, prayerful, and intentional, we are unintentional. We become hands-off and just let life come at us instead of living life for the glory of God. We just want to forget about what is going on around us because, well, quite frankly, we are selfish. The vast majority of us, we don't want to be, we don't want to admit to it, but we are. Think about situations where you, that you've been in. Who are you most worried about? The others in the situation or yourself? Now, think about this. Group photo time. Uh, you're, you know, it's a family event. And you're like, nobody told me we're taking group photos. I didn't dress for this. My hair's a mess. Ladies might say, I don't have makeup on. You're not taking my picture. <laughs> you're worried about yourself and not the others. You don't want to be in the picture. 
here's the thing, because we can be that selfish, there are things that we do that show that we are also short-sighted. What if that is the last picture of someone in your family, and that's the last thing you have to hold on to of them? We tend to say or do things in the moment without thinking about the long-term consequences. These are what I call the oh crap moments. <laughs> it's in these moments that we ask ourselves, what did I say or what did I just do? Then, when the going gets tough, I'm not going to what you normally would hear. So when the going gets tough, and it doesn't always end up with the tough get going. Instead, we realize that we're quitters. Just think about it. Think about the New Year's resolutions you have made over the years of your life. How far did you get before you said, yeah, it's too much. I'm done. But here's something scary. It happens in marriages all the time. We talked about uh, the, the percentage of marriages that end in divorce. And this is not just secular. This is Christians. And it's over 50%. Because what happens? Things get difficult. And they get harder and they get harder. And because of the decisions that we're making, poor and emotionally charged decisions, we get to the point where we just don't want to put in the effort and we give up and ultimately walk away. See, we live in a world where people have lost their passion and they have strayed from God. Is a world where Satan tempts people to take God for granted and to not study his word and to not glorify his name. The word, the world is selfish. And being selfish means we're unfaithful to God and to each other. And if we are consistently prepared and we live intentionally, have an intentionally unselfish life, that helps us to avoid those oh crap moments that will help us to continue running the race all the way to the finish line. Turn all these things that I just said we are and turn them around. We are not what we did in the past. Things you've done in the past, things you, the person you were in the past, you don't have to be. We are who God says we are. And so we need to, again, pre-decide to take our lives back today. That way, if you do get tired, overwhelmed, angry, emotional, discouraged, or depressed, you'll be ready for it because of the decision you are making today to pre-decide how you will address that in the future. And if you stumble, and I popped off in my head to a DC talk song, what if I stumble? If you stumble, good news! We are not saved based on the quality of those decisions, but by the grace of God. Jesus predecided that no matter what pain or what he had to endure, it would be God's will, not his own. That's what he, we read about that. That's what he's praying in the garden, not my will, but yours. Jesus gave his life for each and every one of us so that in our imperfection, we would be made righteous in the eyes of God. And Mike, Mark and I want you to right here, right now, pre-decide to really take this teaching and this series to heart. Today, we got started by giving you some things that you can do to take your life back by changing the direction of your decisions with God's help. And coming up, we will give you the keys to overcome the temptation. We will teach you the power of consistency. We will help you in getting closer to God. And these are all things that, since the inception of this ministry, since we've planted the church, these are all things that fit. So this series just kind of has tied together all these things that we've been doing for almost five years now. We will show you what life can be like when you stop holding back. We will give you one word that will change your life and we will help you to be a finisher 
when you want to give up. So I'm going to end this morning by asking you one question. Nobody has to answer this. Just, you have to answer it to yourself, between you and God. But are you with us? Are you with us? Father, as we take the time today to make this decision to pre-decide well, how we will handle things in the future, that we will handle them by coming to you, Father. That you, through your word, help us to take our life back. That you help us in overcoming temptation. That you can help us to be all these things that we talked about that we are about. Being unintentional and selfish, short-sighted, unprepared, inconsistent quitters. You will show us how to live a life where we can stop holding back by getting closer to you. And that your word will change our lives and that we can be like you gave us Paul as an example. No matter what he went through, he never gave up on you. Father, I just thank you for the series that you have presented to us and for all the things that you will teach us through it, Father. In Jesus' name. This time of communion this morning, I want you to think of not only the sacrifice that Jesus made, but the direction that he took his life. He he had it pre-decided for him before he was born. He was predestined to be the Savior of the world. He was predestined to be your Savior my Savior. And he lived a life, an example of what we need to do to have a fulfilled life through him. And that's the key. See, the stuff of the world makes no difference. The money doesn't make a difference. The stuff you accumulate during your life doesn't make a difference in your life, does not make you fulfilled. So we have to concentrate on what will give us that fulfilled life. What will give us the direction to make the good decisions. Jesus lived that life. He was a living example for us on how we need to live. On what we need to do. we got to read the book. we got to follow the directions. So as we come into this time of communion today, I kind of want you to think about this. Because this is a time to remember and up on the screen it says, this do in remembrance of me. Hey, remember the example that I gave you. Not just the sacrifice on the cross, which is extremely important. But remember what I said. Remember what I did. Remember the teachings on the Sermon of the Mount. The Olivet Message. Remember the Great Commission going to all the world and make disciples of all men. He empowered us to go out and be something and to do something with our life. We need to remember what Christ should mean for us and does mean for us. On the night that he was given up, Christ took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. That means that he took the sins of the world, all the bad stuff that was going to be in our lives, and is now broken through his body. Likewise, later in the meal, he took the cup. And after he blessed it, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. He washes us clean with his blood. We need to remember as we take this communion each time that we are gathered together it says that we are to break bread amongst ourselves and we are to drink remembering the sacrifices remembering the life of Christ do this in remembrance of me so this is just not a 
snack or refreshment in the middle of the service. It is more than that. It is, this is Christ's body. This is the representation of Christ for us. The body of Christ broken for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. some Sunday mornings you just don't feel like you want to go to church, you're exhausted, you're tired, you just don't want to go. And, and I went into the, the bathroom and I thought, I'm going to put eye drops in so I can see better this morning. And, and of course I didn't have my glasses on, so I grabbed the eardrops instead. Oh, no. And I put them in my right eye. And oh my goodness, burn, burn, burn. Oh, <laughs> so thank you Jesus, I'm awake now. And, uh, <laughs> And it reminded me that, you know, in all circumstances, we're to thank him for things. You know, thank him for the pain, thank him for all things. Because, you know, through the thankfulness and, and bringing me here this morning, I woke up right away and I was like, okay, God, I'm going to come to church this morning now. So, you know, that's just something we need to remember. And there, there's a lot of pain in this world and a lot of our bodies go through a lot of pain. But if we thank him for all things, we will come through the pain and come through all of it. So, thanks for listening to me this morning. So, is there anyone who would like prayer this morning? So, I like prayers for the Elam family. The Elam family? Yeah. Uh, another classmate passed away this week. And, and uh, so, I just want to pray for their family and uh, lift them up in this time of loss. Okay. Okay, anyone else? this morning? Okay, let's go to God in prayer. We come before you today with awe and reverence for our Lord Jesus Christ. You are the great physician, the Prince of Peace, the great I Am. We praise and honor you, O God, for you are a consuming fire. In your word it says, if we knock, the door will be open. We come together today and we knock at your door. We trust you for your healing power over all of Grace Street people here today and listening online. We boldly come before your throne and know that you, through you, all things happen for our good. We may not like going through the fire, but you are refining our lives for service in your kingdom. Let us feel your mighty power and presence and healing in our lives and our bodies. Father God, we lift up the Elam family um, for their um, passing of their loved one this week. We just pray and thank you for their, his life, and we just honor you, Lord God, that we can be part of their lives, and we just love on them and just put people in their path, Lord God, that will raise them up and give them peace and comfort as they go through this trial this week, Lord Jesus. We lift up Kim and Pam today. We thank you for their lives. We thank you for their healing. We know and trust you completely for their strength and energy each and every day. Give them courage, grace, and provision for the medication they are taking to cancel this cancer out of their bodies. Let the medicine only do their bodies good. Do not let it harm them in any way. Let your healing power and the blood of Jesus wash over them and cover them completely. For by your stripes they are healed. And we praise and thank you, Father God, for their healing. Father God, we lift up Becky and her family for their health and healing while they search for a new home. I pray the armor of God cover over them, that you will protect their bodies from all illness that tries to attack them. Let no weapon formed against them prosper. Be with Becky and comfort her daily. We ask, Father God, for grace and mercy on America 
We are not worthy to be in your presence, but without you, O God, we have no hope. So I ask, O Lord, that you let your face shine on America again. Let the Christians rise up, open our mouths to praise and worship you. May God give us passionate hearts to move and do your will and not our own, so that we may be one nation under God once more. And Hebrews 13:20-21. Hebrews 13, 20, 21. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well and pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So as I thought about scripture to send us out with today, I'm drawn all the way to the end of the book. <laughs> Revelation 22. Because this requires decision making. Verse 17 says, The spirit and the bride say, Come, that anyone who hears this say, Come. This requires a decision. That anyone who is thirsty, Come. That anyone who desires drink freely from the water of life. These are those good decisions. Continues and it says, And I solemnly declare to everyone who hears the words of prophecy written in this book, if anyone who hears the words of prophecy add anything to what is written here, God will add to that person the place described in this book. I read that I used to think of the different religions that would add to it and say they were Christian but I also think about the things that we purposely add of this world to our lives maybe it's not adding a, a book per se but it's adding thoughts in our minds that are beyond what this book tells us what we should do and I pre-decided a long time ago I didn't want to make that decision goes on to say, and if anyone removes any of the words from this book of prophecy, God will remove that person's share in the tree of life and in the holy city that are described in this book. Again, these don't have to be written. These are things that we do or maybe say. He who is the faithful witness to all of these things says, yes, I am coming back. Jesus' words, yes, I am coming back. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's holy people, you, all of you, in Jesus' name, go in peace.